My name is Keaton Washburn, and I'm the student director here. Um, I'm so thankful to, to be here this morning and have the chance to, to share God's word um, with you. Uh, as we begin, I just want to begin with a word of prayer, so would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for life. We thank you for today and, and the breath that's in our lungs. Lord, we just receive that as a gift from you God, I thank you for the chance that we have to gather this morning, the chance that we have to open your word. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us this morning, that you would show us what it means to mature in our understanding of you, Lord, and and in our um, walk with you. God, would your Holy Spirit just be here speaking to every single one of us? Would your spirit intercede, fill in the gaps? Lord, would you give me words? I give you all the glory, and I ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So this morning, this month, actually, um, we are in a series called Family Dinner. And so um, February here is Family Month, and so we're doing events all throughout the month. Um, so, you know, specifically for, for families, we want to celebrate families, but we also want to take the chance to celebrate um, us as a, as a church family. Um, it's one of the great privileges of, of a church. It's being um, a family, but with it being Family Month, they naturally asked the student guy to share, um, but I'm so excited to be here this morning. Um, but as um, you're sitting here, you may be wondering, what does a 23-year-old have to share about God's Word? What he, what, what, not about God's Word, pardon me, but what authority does he have to share about parenting, to share about family? And I admit this morning that I'm not the final authority on parenting. I don't have kids. I'm 23, year old, 23 years old. Um, but I have a family, I have two amazing parents that are here this morning, and I've seen it modeled what it means to be godly parents. I've seen what it means to be in a family. I've seen what it means to be part of a church family. And so I, I speak from that this morning as we are focusing on families. So I want to begin just with a little bit of, of history um, of, of myself um, And really, even before myself, my parents. So my parents, uh, my mom came to know Christ at a young age, and my dad came to know Christ when he was in his 20s. And so they got married. A couple years later, they had me. And so by the time I was born, I had two parents who knew the Lord, and I'm so thankful for that blessing. Um, When I was born, my my parents were very involved at their church. and, And as a child, I remember growing up, and my parents... I knew that they loved the Lord, and I'm so thankful for that. I remember as a child um, growing up, we were oftentimes the the first people to church to help set up. We were some of the last to leave because my parents were faithful. They were servants, and they wanted to honor God. I remember as as a kid, uh, my parents, they sent me to Christian school all the way from kindergarten to 12th grade, um, both my siblings and myself. And one of the things about my school specifically is that Every week in elementary, we would have a verse quiz, and so this is a verse that we would learn, and we would get tested on it, but my parents, I can just picture in my mind that when I was in elementary, you know, the, the week leading up to the verse quiz, the, the night before, sometimes if we put it off, they would come and sit in my bed with me, and they would help me to memorize God's word because they saw the importance of God's word in their own lives And they wanted me to understand. They wanted me to know God's word. And to this day, I'm so thankful for my parents and and what they modeled for me. I'm thankful that they took the time to help me understand God's word. Just even uh, last week, I was talking with Pastor Josh, and and, um, we were debating about who the name of the apostle that replaced Judas. And we weren't debating. We were talking about this. and, And I remember like we were, no, neither of us could remember the name, and then it hit me, like the apostle's name, and it, it was because the time that my parents had invested with me in learning God's word that I was able to remember this, and in God's word is a part of my life because of my parents. Like I said, my parents, they faithfully served. They set that model for me, and I'm so thankful for them. They encouraged me to memorize scripture, um, and my parents grew up in their faith. They came to know Christ at different ages, and they've continued to grow in their walk with him, and I'm so thankful for that. And so now I stand here, and I am here as a result 
of my parents. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ because of what I saw modeled in my parents, a true faith, a true understanding of God. I'm here in student ministry because of my parents and what I saw modeled in them. And I'm here. I'm going to be getting married in, in June to my fiance. Her name's Haley. She lives down in Ohio, so fortunately she's not here this morning. We're getting married in June, and we aspire to, to raise a family where Christ is the center because of what we've seen modeled by my parents. And so, that's where I speak from this morning. That's where I'm, I'm coming from. And the thing that, so if you're here this morning, and if you don't know Christ, I'm going to just begin by laying out what we're about, why we're here. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. It begins with the bad news that every single one of us have sinned, we're, we're messed up. We've been separated from our perfect and our holy God because of our sin, because we are not perfect. But God in his goodness sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life that we could not, to die the death that we deserved, to pay the penalty on the cross for the consequences for all of our sins. And then Jesus died. He came back to life to show his power over death, his power over sin, and then he ascended to be with the Father. And Jesus offers that perfect life to every single one of us. And if you've never made that decision to turn from your ways and to follow Christ, to accept what he's done, there's no better time than right now. And if you have made that decision to follow Christ, I'm so glad. I'm so thankful. And I want to speak to those this morning that have made that decision to follow Christ because the temptation is that when we choose to follow Christ, we oftentimes stop right there. We choose to turn from our ways. We begin to change the way we live, but we never actually grow up. It's kind of like this. It's like if we were to walk into a restaurant and you saw an adult sitting there eating baby food out of a jar of baby food. We would be like, what in the world? You walk into a restaurant and you see an adult, you're expecting them to be eating a real meal, but instead they're eating out of a jar of baby food. We would take a second glance, we would be confused, we would think something is not right here. But oftentimes, in our walk with the Lord, we choose to eat that baby food. We choose to continue to be spiritual infants, as the Bible tells us. We never move on from the baby food. We never choose to grow up to mature in our understanding of God. Oftentimes we walk into church and we see people that metaphorically are still spiritual infants that are eating the spiritual baby food. We don't even think twice about it because we become numb to it. But Christ has so much more for us. And if we choose to continue to only eat this baby food, if we choose to settle for so much less than what God has for us, Lives are on the line. Souls are in the balance because the people around us will not see a changed life that Jesus Christ has brought about. As the people around us, we won't be sharing Christ with them if we're content for less than what God has for us. The people that walk into our church are going to turn around and walk out because they see these people who are still selfish, who are still self-centered, that are spiritual infants. But Christ has so much more for us. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be focusing on verses 7 through 16. But I want to, I want to just begin by kind of looking at the beginning of chapter 4. So in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus here. And he's speaking to them in verses 1 through 6 about the unity and the faith the unity about being one body as, as believers of Jesus Christ, being united in all that we do. Paul speaks of how he's eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, how there's one body of Christ, there's one Spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So we get this picture of a church, a body of believers that are united in all things. But Paul continues on to speak of the differences and how these differences actually work to unite us. 
So if you begin reading with me in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, it says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, Paul here is summarizing Psalm 68, when he ascended on high, so this is Jesus, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So grace was given to each one of us that are a follower of Christ according to the measure of Christ's gift. All of us that are in Christ have been given a gift. These gifts look different, but Christ has, has given them. If we move on to verse 11, we begin to see some of these gifts that Christ has given to us after he came to the earth and then ascended back up to the heaven. In verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. So some of the roles, these are, these are roles in, in church leadership usually. An apostle, it's a term we don't, don't use very much these days, but Christ has given apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers. An apostle really just means one who is sent, somebody who is sent out. I believe that an, an apostle in, in this sense means one of the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ who were sent by him and they were given the authority to write the word of God. It speaks of prophets. A prophet is, is someone who speaks on behalf of God. We oftentimes think of a prophet as somebody who foretells the future. But really, what a prophet is, it's someone that speaks on behalf of God. They don't foretell, they, they forthtell. They're proclaiming the word of God. So every time somebody gets up here and shares the word of God, they're speaking on behalf of God, and, and that's a prophet. And, and I believe some, some in this church might disagree, even um, some of the church leadership, you know, we, we disagree on this, but, but I believe that anyone who speaks on behalf of God as a, as a prophet must get their authority from the word of God. So a prophet is someone who speaks on behalf of God. An evangelist, that's someone who shares Christ. Oftentimes it's these people that have a gift that they just share Christ everywhere they go. Christ has given shepherds, so, so pastors, and teachers, those that, that are teaching, whether it's up here, whether it's in a growth community, whether it's with the children in the nursery and the kids, whatever it might be. Christ has given these. And we see in verse 12, Christ has given these positions of leadership to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And so, as we're looking at what it means to move on, to grow up in our faith, the first way that we mature into Christ is by being under the influence of those that God has placed over us spiritually. The evangelists, the teachers, the shepherds, we mature into Christ. We move on from this baby food by being under the leadership of those that God has placed over us. So by being here, you're choosing to be under the leadership, the spiritual leadership that God has placed over you by seeking out advice and, and counsel from those that God has placed over you. It's what it means to be under the influence of those that God has placed over us. We see here, verse 12 as well, that we mature into Christ by serving, by being in ministry, as it says. Christ has given these gifts of leadership to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So there's, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, there is a ministry that God has for you. There is a gifting that God has placed on your life that you are to be, to be using. We oftentimes just use the word serving. So we mature into Christ by being in ministry, by serving. If you're not serving, you're probably still somewhat of a spiritual infant. You have not grown up. If you're not using what God has given you, every single one of us must take the time to assess ourselves, whether to decide whether we aren't even a child of God 
whether we're a spiritual infant, where we're still eating this baby food, where we're not using what God has given us, or whether we are growing up, or whether you are, have matured in Christ. And if you've matured in Christ, you're under the leadership of those that God has placed over you. You're in ministry. You're serving. Someone that is a mature follower of Christ doesn't say, I should be serving, or I think I'll serve, or I'll serve when they need me. But a mature follower of Christ means that you are serving. It's kind of like this. In our country today, the unemployment rate is that well, it's about 3.5%, the lowest that it's been in years. So that means that over 90% of our country is working. And there's a statistic that we often hear about the church, and it's that 20% of the people are doing 80% of the serving. So that means if we were to look at the church as a whole, that means the unemployment rate in the church is like 80%. And if we saw a country where the unemployment rate was 80%, something would be off. We would say, this country is, is not producing at top levels. It's not working correctly. But for some reason in the church, we're okay with that when Christ has so much more for us. Move on to, to verse 13 here. Paul says that the apostles, the prophets, he's given them to equip the saints to build up the body of Christ, verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we have not matured spiritually until we've matured to the fullness of Christ. And so as you evaluate yourself, we're not to evaluate ourselves against those around us, those around us are not our standard. Our standard of our spiritual maturity is Christ himself. Does your life look like him? Does your life look like his? Do you love the way he's loved? Do you know the Father the way that he does? This is who we measure ourselves up against. And I want to speak specifically to parents here. What are you modeling to your children as a parent, if you're not maturing, if you've chosen to settle for the baby food, you can't expect your children to mature. As a parent, if you're not serving, you can't expect your children to serve. As a parent, if you're not aware of the lies that the culture is telling us, you can't expect your children to be aware. As a parent, if you're not in a growth community, you can't expect your children to be in a growth community. As a parent, if you aren't giving, you can't expect your children to give. I've seen, I've shared myself the role that my parents have played in my life. So as a parent, what are you modeling for your children? Verse 14, we measure ourselves against the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. A spiritual infant, someone that has not matured, is like a child. They're tossed to and fro by the waves. They don't know what they believe. They fall prey to the lies that the world is telling us. The thing is that if you've known Christ for more than a little while, you should not be falling prey to the lies of the world as, as the, lev the level of expectation of where you are to be spiritually progresses as the growing up occurs. The longer that you've known Christ, the further along you should be in your walk with him. It's like um, I, I have a little cousin. His name is Jason. He just turned four years old. And Jason um, can be a spitfire at times, um, and he goes to Awana at our Holly location. And so um, after I got the job here a couple months ago, I was, I was hanging out with him. We, had, we were getting together as a family, 
And I said, hey, Jason, he's four years old. I said, you go to Awana on Wednesday nights, right? And I said, do you know Tommy? Tommy is the children's pastor at the Holly location, and he leads Awana. And he said, you mean Pastor Tommy? And I said, yeah, Pastor Tommy. I said, I work with Pastor Tommy. I know Pastor Tommy. And he goes, oh, okay. He goes back to his coloring or whatever he's doing. And I said, hey, I said, since I know Pastor Tommy, you know Pastor Tommy. You should tell him that Keaton says hi. He knows me. And Jason just kind of looks up at me, and he goes, I'm not going to do that. And he goes back to his coloring. And at first I was like, what? Okay. But because he's four years old, it's okay that, that he says these things. But if a, an adult, if I'd had the conversation with an adult, and an adult goes, I'm not going to do that rudely to me, like that wouldn't be okay because the level of expectation progresses as, as we grow up. The same is true in our walk with Christ. And so we see in verse 14 that we mature into Christ by examining what we believe. Because when we choose not to examine what we believe, we're like children. We're tossed to and fro by the waves. We're carried about by every wind of doctrine, every lie that the world tells us. We just, we fall prey to it. As a family, the world tells us lies. As parents, the world will tell you lies. The world will tell you that God wants you to be happy. He doesn't want you to be holy. Well, and that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says that God wants us to be holy. The world tells us that the more we acquire things, the more things we acquire, the happier we'll be, the better our life will be. That's not what Scripture says. The world tells us that as a parent, you're just supposed to be a friend to your child. You can't tell them no. They'll never love you. It's not what Scripture says as a, as a parent. The world says that parents aren't supposed to be parents. They're supposed to be friends with their kids. It's not true. The world says that it's okay for your kids to be self-centered, narcissistic, self-focused. That's not the case. Christ has so much more for us. The world tells us that sports are more important than church. The world tells us that sports are more important than growth communities when it's so not true. Christ has so much more for us. The world tells us that as a husband, as a wife, that you'd be so much happier if you were with this person instead of who you're currently married to. And we fall prey to these lies that the world tells us when we do not examine what we believe. Rather, we mature into Christ when we examine what we believe, we move on from being a spiritual infant. We move on from that baby food. Moving on to verse 15. Paul says, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So rather than being like the world, which seeks to deceive, which is crafty, which is seeking to lie. A mature follower of Christ speaks the truth in love. So we mature into Christ by speaking truthfully in love, in contrast to verse 14. Our temptation is to speak the truth in anger. I see it in myself when I get upset I just want to tell that person the truth, and I do not want to say it in love. But we mature into Christ by speaking truthfully in love. If we look at the Greek word here for speaking truthfully, it could really be translated as truthing. So not just speaking truthfully, but being true in everything that we do. Speaking truthfully in the way that we live, living truthfully, it's not just about what you say, but it's about how you live. A mature believer in Christ lives honestly, not seeking to deceive. And their goal is love. They speak truthfully in love. Is love your goal? Is growing up into Christ your goal? What is your goal? In verse 16, pardon me, backing up just a little bit into verse 15, we're to grow up 
in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. We're not growing up to be like the believer next to us. We're growing up to be like Christ. Christ who is the head of the body of believers. Christ is the head. The body doesn't work, move, grow apart from our head. And the same is true as a believer in Christ, as part of the body of Christ. Christ is the head. We cannot mature into Christ apart from him. As we mature into Christ, it doesn't, apart, doesn't we cannot mature separate from him. The maturity, the growth, it comes from Christ. When we choose to mature into Christ by following what he has laid out for us, he will grow us. It's like, a, it's like a child again. How many of you have ever given a gift to a child and usually one of two things will happen? Either they love it and they play with it forever or they love it for a day and a half and then they put it aside to never play with it again. If you've given a child that gift, they play with it, they set it aside two days later and never play with it again, you're not going to get them the expansion pack. You're not going to get them the new one when the new one comes out because they are not using it, because they don't care for it. And the same is true in the Christian life. When we choose not to use what God has given us, the ministry that he's given us, the life that he's given us, the mind that he's given with us, the people around us that he's given to us. When we choose not to use them, we're setting them aside and God is not going to bless us with more. He's not going to grow us because we're not even using what he has already given us. What's on the line here? If we choose to continue to be spiritual infants, to not grow up, to not mature into Christ, the entire body of Christ is going to be affected. We see in verse 16, the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. When each part is working properly. So if you, if I choose to settle for less than what God has for me. We're affecting the entire body of Christ, not just here in our local community, here in our body of believers, but in the body of believers across the whole entire world. So when we choose not to grow, we choose not to mature, to move on from the baby food, when we choose to just come and sit every week, but never to grow, the entire body of Christ is hindered. The goal of the body of Christ is to build itself up in love. We cannot do this apart from one another. If you're a parent, what are you modeling for your children? That you've arrived spiritually, that you're content on the baby food? Or that God is still molding you more and more into the image of Christ. Spiritual parents, spiritual grandparents, those in here that have known Christ for a long time, what are you modeling to those that are younger in their faith? That you've arrived or that there's so much more that Christ has for you, that you are continuing to grow, that you're maturing into Christ by being under the influence of those that God has placed over you, by being in ministry, by examining what you believe, by speaking truthfully in love, and by depending on Christ. If you've known Christ for a while, I would challenge you to find somebody who is younger than you in their faith. Walk with them. Show them what it means to mature into Christ. It might be a child already shared about the influence that my parents had on me. It might be somebody here. Maybe it's somebody outside of I don't know who it is, 
but find somebody. If you're not in a growth community, if you're not growing, find one, head to guest services. They would love to connect you with one. As a church, if we mature into Christ by being under the leadership that God has placed over us, by serving, by examining our beliefs, by speaking truthfully in love and depending on Christ, we will build the body of believers up in love. Our community will see the way that we love one another, the way that we work together, the way that we care for one another, the way that we put others first. They will see the difference. As a parent, when you choose to mature into Christ, your children will grow up seeing what it means to be spiritually mature, and they will not settle. And ultimately, when we choose to mature into Christ, Christ will be glorified, will fulfill our purpose as a church and as Christians. Let's not settle for less than what God has for us. Take this chance. Don't settle for that baby food, but chase after what God has for you. He has so much more than the baby food. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you. You've not left us alone to our own devices. God, we thank you that when we depend on you, that when we seek after you, Lord, that you are with us, that you walk with us, that you grow us, Lord, that you bring the growth. Lord, I pray that you would show us what it means to be fully devoted, that you would show us what it means to chase after you, Lord, to mature into all that you have for us. Lord, would our community see a difference in us as a church? Would they see a difference in us as believers? We thank you for your word. We ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.